Hello everyone, welcome. In this presentation, I'll discuss about structural adjustment programs, its role, effects, and outcomes in Kenya. I'll make a description since the independence period, all the way during the structural adjustment period and post structural adjustment period. In this slide, I'll make an overview of the structural adjustment, pre adjustment, during the adjustment period, and the post adjustment period. In this slide, I will make a, a further overview of what structural adjustment is, who proposed them, and how they were implemented, or what circumstances led to the implementation of structural adjustment period, or the recommendation. First of all, in our topics earlier during, in our classes, we, dis we discussed about the Bretton Woods institutions like IMF and World Bank. International Monetary Fund and World Bank, particularly. So, going back, post Second World War, USA currency, the US dollar became the most dominant currency. The, we can remember in the Bretton Woods Agreement that the US currency became the dominant currency, playing the dominant role in the financial markets, the financial system. The all the other currencies were pegged to the US currency. The US currency was alternatively pegged to the price of gold. This is how IMF and World Bank pretty much became very dominant financial institutions around the world. And therefore, we can make an ass assessment of how they ended up becoming gold posts. Of how an economy should be run. Kenyan economy is not an island. It also suffered a lot from external shocks. We remember from our discussion in the Naomi Klein book, uh, The Shock Doctrine, that the fundamentalists of a free market economy always use as a particular shock moment to spread a free market or li uh, liberal ideas about free market. So this shock moment for Kenyan context is the oil crisis. Remember, oh, Kenya does not have an oil. Price shocks devastatingly affected Kenyan exporters. Global depression, coup, military coup that happened in Kenya around 1982. The Kenyan economy is stagnating and different periods of chaos during elections. So generally, Structural adjustment period, uh, programs were economic reforms, economic proposals recommended to make a structural change in the Kenyan economy in view of looking forward to remove or solve the problems of inequality, deal with underdevelopment and poverty. So in this description and in this presentation, I will make an assessment whether these goals have been achieved or not. You can see this guy, he was the president of Kenya, the second president of Kenya, most longest serving president of Kenya. So pretty much he, during his term, the structural adjustment period, during his term, that was when the SAPs were implemented in Kenya. So going back uh, during or post independence, the first president of Kenya, led the country into a public or a state control economy where the state played a dominant role in the economy. Kenyan economy was good, in good shape. Infant mortality was low. 77 persons died about every 1,000. Life expectancy was at 59 years, way higher than neighboring countries, pretty much above average compared to the sub-Saharan African continent. There was almost near universal primary school enrollment. Every Kenyan child was able to access education and so on and so forth. And then Kenya decided to pretty much set forth on making the economy dependent on the state, dependent on the public sector. And therefore, the president, the first president, realizing this and, you know, he is, by the way, 
anti-socialism, anti-neo-Marxist philosophy because remember the Cold War ideology was going on, geopolitical tensions between the West and the Soviet Union. So the, pres the first president of Kenya was pro-capitalism even though in practical terms Kenya was socialist state. He did not, he did not uphold this neo-Marxist philosophy like it was in the neighboring Tanzania. But however, in practical terms, he organized the country to de be dependent on the public state. Majority of Kenyans were reliant on the state. Majority of Kenyans' employees were hired by the state. Therefore, the state was everything. And therefore, he wanted to make this system more efficient. Uh, he did not foresee, or rather, Kenya did not find itself running a private activity, private enterprise, or free market, rather. And therefore, public enterprise, public sector was, was the dominant partaker in the Kenyan's economy. And therefore, he chose to send a group of people to make a consultation with the public in order to streamline the public service sector. And therefore, in 1973, Mr. Dengua, the director of Central Bank of Kenya, Pierre, director of Kenya Shell, and a group of the other men just decided to by the calling of the president to make public consultations on how the public sector will be more transformed and more streamlined. Remember at the time, women in Kenya were not able to have identity cards. They were not able to be hired by the state. If once they get married, they should resign. They are only paid gratuity money. They are only hired on temporary terms on a contractual basis. Pretty much there were harsher conditions for women and therefore, in the Ndegwa report of 1973, the commission recommended to the president to streamline tax collection to increase a more role for women to play in the economy and also to increase more avenues for tax collection and to increase payment salaries for the civil servants because that was the dominant a stakeholder in the economy, the public service, the public sector, the civil service. So at the time Kenya faced difficulties, the neighboring countries, particularly Tanzania, was a socialist state. The other country, Uganda, was very hostile, run by Idi Amin. Even though I will describe that Kenya, Kenya's economy was much better but than the by than the neighboring countries because Kenya even though it was a mixed economy, partly socialist economy, and then partly capitalist economy, uh, there was partial free market enterprise. And therefore, the Ndugu report actually recommended the president to allow civil servants to participate in private activity, to trade with the government, to do business with the government, and therefore also to, to retire some of civil service in you know, order to in order to make civil service more efficient, more streamlined, more, more suitable uh, for the economy and also to streamline job groups, job functions, streamline salary allocations for civil servants. So basically in this era, Kenyan economy was public, run by the state, state control and everything. However, we can, we can still acknowledge the fact that Kenya's, Kenya had a free primary education for every seven years, up to seven years in primary school for every Kenyan children in the year 1974. And then and then in, during the President Moyes era, the second president of Kenya, who is seen in this slide, uh, introduced free, mil free, free milk program, school milk program for every child in Kenya, especially in, in primary school. But again, uh, these activities were held were able to be done by Kenya, not because the Kenyan economy could afford it, but rather there were geopolitical tensions at the time, and therefore Cold War was going on. And Kenya was pretty much benefiting from donor aid with no conditions because the West was fighting the communist Soviet Union, and therefore conditions were not placed on donor money, and Kenya, Kenya was able to afford, was afford to put school milk program, vast programs run by the state, sponsored by and regulated by the state, funded by donor money to sponsor school children feeding program. But as you know, unfortunately problems came when 
the Soviet Union collapsed in, in the 1990s and immediately donor money was stopped and the donors started to make conditions on their money and but Kenya was not ready for these conditions were placed structural adjustment period began people were allowed to make recommendations on how the economy should be run uh, different from being run by the public rather by private entities be accepted to protect in the economy running of the economy so but however Kenyan politicians were not ready for this structural change they were very afraid of sacrifices the Kenyan economy will will be hard hit and sacrifices on the majority of Kenyans major, uh, citizens and as you know they were afraid that since colonial era just ended about two decades ago and uh, the Kenyan majority were not able were not you know as a, as a result or as a function or as a result of the colonial era inequalities the Kenyan public Kenyan majority were not ready for structural adjustment because they could not withstand shocks in the market forces and therefore without this protection of the state in their view so it was it will be very catastrophic and therefore they decided rather to make short and very slow procedural changes in the economy there was a political lack of political will fear of adjustment so one of the reforms was civil service reforms reduce or retire more civil servants in order to allow more private activity business activity free market enterprise market liberalization stop more price controls stop you know stop controlling the currency make the currency free floating uh, open the stock market even though Kenyan economy at the time uh, they decided to open up partially the stock market the resultant effects were dumping immediately effects such as dumping product dumping from overseas because um, you know Kenya had now quite rather partially though decided to move into free market enterprise which rather mean market forces not the government will maintain or determine which product will sell in the market and which will not and therefore foreign products which were more competitive in prices were able to sell in the market and therefore Kenyan farmers lost a lot so there's a what they call dumping the foreign products which are rather cheaper less quality were rampant in the market and this caused a lot of harmful damage to the Kenyan farmers and the and the Kenyan economy was really in bad shape so I agree that uh, at this period the government decided to make a shift to look into ways of protecting the farmers protecting their the economy rather in other words bringing in government the state back into the economy in this slide I'll try to make a description of how first of all the GDP growth was really how it looked like in the beginning like for example in 2007 GDP per capita growth versus GDP growth 2007 was quite high and also in 2010 2011 2013 but remember in 2008 it fell sharply to the negative side because there was elections at that time post-election violence Kenyan economy almost started to stop and most foreign investors fled and also you can see in 2012 there's a deep deep drop in the GDP per capita yeah GDP per capita growth and also in 2016 all of which are related to elections and I will argue that they are all functions of the structural adjustments which were required of uh, the loan funded by donors in the IMF the World Bank yeah because in the beginning Kenya was rather one party state dictatorship and since 
the beginning in 1963, post election, post independence, Kenya was run for almost four decades by one part, one party, Kanu, and one president. President Moi ruled Kenya for about 24 years, and therefore structural adjustment period even included somehow liberalization of the market and as well as improvement of human rights which also included electoral democracy, representative democracy, elections, voting, one man, one vote, and so on and so forth. So these shocks were not, were not possible if uh, the Kenyan economy perhaps was run by a stable party with no chaotic elections. In this slide I will discuss about inflation. So rather I will make an, an overview that inflation in Kenya could be felt in perhaps in this chart, in this histogram. During 2002, most also in 2000, okay 1994 as well. Price, price per index was very high quite rather in 1992 and as you remember this time was uh, the military coup was around this time 1992 prices went up as well as in 2002 there was a contested elections and what happens is when Kenyan's currency uh, goes down or up the exporters of, of you know, Kenyan economy exporters have good time because they, their products are able to be cheaper, they can sell to markets of, overseas. However, the importers have hard time importing products because Kenyan, Kenyan currency devalues and they are not able to purchase because the currency is not stronger. Therefore, such instances might be as a result of market liberalization. Kenyan economy is, never, is no longer closed but open to market forces, open to shocks that come from abroad or from overseas or domestically so on. In this slide I'll discuss about the trends in food production consumption and sufficiency. So prior to adjustment 1984-1988 annual average food production was at 7.7 percent and then during adjustment period it dropped to 0.1 percent per capita food production at 4.0 percent a drop to four, negative 4.3 percent during adjustment period as well as you can see the average food consumption grew at 6.2 percent prior to adjustment during adjustment it grew at, at a very low margin of 0.7 percent and per capita food consumption at 6.2 percent and dropped to 2.6 percent so quite in summary Food production in Kenya was at a good level prior to adjustment and at a bad level after adjustment. One explanation is, in my view, with the market liberalization, exporters were allowed to sell the products at the competitive prices dependent on the market forces. So that means they are not how to be selling to the Kenyan, Kenyan buyers fast. Whoever whoever is can buy at a good price at a better price or a higher price the high high value customer if that customer is in Uganda is in is in the USA or elsewhere they will sell to him rather so there were no protections for Kenyan buyers and therefore the food sufficiency in Kenya decreased as you remember the structure structural adjustment period also came up came in with increased poverty, low income wealth for Kenyan middle class and therefore diminishing power, purchasing power for many Kenyans they are not able to buy products and therefore most food were exported and uh, you know one major factor as well is the subsidy, a decrease in subsidies during this adjustment period meant that the products were sold at market prices, no subsidy from the government. Therefore, market prices are usually competitive at high price point. As well as, oh, quite rather, ex exports were emphasized during the structural adjustment period.
In this slide, I'll make an explanation of the trend in education. So school enrollment was very high prior to adjustment, dropped after adjustment. So teacher training colleges was very high at 28,683 prior to adjustment, dropped to 19,154 post adjustment. So one major explanation for this is that government expenditure in education decreased as a, as a proposal for structural adjustment, structural change rather, which meant Kenya has to make a change. The, the state must stop interfering or regulating the economy. And therefore, the, my education, even though basic, basic commodity, will be determined by market forces. So that meant that market forces always look for the highest profit yields. And therefore, the most vulnerable are not able to access education at all. If you can imagine, uh, per capita GDP of uh, an average Kenyan was about $280. And just taking a, your child to school in, in one form, form one for one year could take you about $500, just almost twice the average per capita GDP of an ordinary Kenyan. So this explains why there, there was a major shift in the levels of education, access, of edu access to education, or the expense, rather, during the adjustment period as compared to pre-adjustment period. In this slide, I will discuss about trends in child malnutrition from one year old, two year old, three year old, and four year old. So Kenyan, Kenyan child malnutrition levels decreased rather during the adjustment period. I'll try to make an assessment of why, but first of all, The nutrition level or measures of nutrition is described in the manner of, for example, the height of a child and what is the recommended age for that particular height? What is the recommended age for that particular weight? What is the recommended height or what's the recommended height or weight for that particular height? So, for example, a child who is five, four years old weighing weighing less than the weight expected of that age, an indication of child malnutrition. So this was conducted by the Kenyan state in the Rural Child Nutrition Surveys of 1977, 78 and 79, the Household Welfare Monitoring and Evolution Survey of 1993, and quite later, the Northeastern Drought Baseline Study. So. The major reason post is because with the structural adjustment period and the recommendations have therefore recommendations were that the state should stop participating in the economy, whether it's in the health sector, and therefore government spend, spending was limited, was reduced rather. What happens with the vulnerable Kenyan majority? They were gravely affected. They were not able to participate in accessing better, better health. There was higher child mortality, higher maternal de deaths, especially consider during the drought in the northeastern region in the 1980s, many, many children died, less children below the age of five years. In this slide, I will discuss about the trends in labor, uh, how the labor force in Kenya operated, how they were regulated. So first of all, Kenyan economy was run, first of all, by formal sector and as well as informal sector. The formal sector, civil service, as I described earlier, the Kenyan economy is a mixed economy, partly capitalist, partly socialist. Formal economy had about 15% of Kenyan labor workforce informal sector 85 percent majority by the way so informal sector included small-scale agricultural farmers small-scale manufacturers small-scale indigenous artisans so 
this group of people had the most and the formal sector had the least. But unfortunately, one scenario in Kenya, unlike industrialized countries, is there is no employment protections. There's no secu social security benefits. There's no protections or benefits, unemployment benefits or compensation rather. So every Kenyan worker must work at all costs. Whether they are paid at low, low wages, they have to work, otherwise there is no other option. Unfortunately, as time was progressing, Kenyan was producing educated elites, but there was no productive work for them. So Kenya this time decided to make some shifts in their development trajectory. There was discussion about social dimensions of development as playing a key role in the development strategy. The government decided to include environmental sustainability in the labor workforce. They also tried to increase rural development in order to enhance more work availability for people. Particularly, uh, the rural development included crop diversification uh, for farmers. The government encouraged extension services to the farmers. Subsidies were implemented to the farmers. Government decided to participate actually in lowering the prices for commodities, farm imports, fertilizers. Also increased credit to, credit to farmers, enhanced more activity by women in the economy, increasing more access to credit schemes by women, increasing also micro credit system in a broader sense. So at this rate, actually, we can say that government came back to participate in the economy because they felt that was the most responsible way. I'll try to make a description before I jump to this slide that at this moment um, that Kenya decided to make a shift to public sector driven economy rather than entirely market driven economy because of the shortcomings of the market driven economy and Kenya was not really ready for uh, such a shift in market liberalization. So, by the way, Nyayo Tea Farms, this farm was an indication actually of the participation of the state directly in safeguarding national interest, what we call public good. So, government actually participated in agriculture, in, in ensuring food security with, while, re, while requiring that there's no need to consider market forces when food security was in jeopardy. So the careful government participated in market, participated in the economy, government decided to sell products uh, directed to the, to the public at a low cost, affordable cost, without regard to the market. Otherwise, the market will not provide such services to the people. So I'd like to mention about the social dimensions of development that, uh, you know, previously in the structural adjustment period, the economy was the dominant role. People and the environment had a little role or little side, and therefore profits, market forces in economy was, was the main important, important element of the market-driven economy. The government decided that was very dangerous. They decided to, to, to go back to ensuring social dimensions of development as a strategy, as a new strategy rather, whereby people and environment are placed above economy. Therefore, economy was supposed to serve the people and the environment, not the other way around. So the structural adjustment programs growth model was seen as a failure, big failure. The experiment was a failure in Kenya and the mission collapsed. Remember, the mission of the structural adjustment period was to reduce inequality, deal with underdevelopment, and reduce or deal with poverty, entrenched poverty. But unfortunately, it did not even try to solve any of it. So the government tried to mitigate 
the adverse effects of the structure adjustment programs using social dimensions to tackle the economy by state participation directly in ensuring that key elements of the society that people depend on basic elements were sponsored directly and regulated by the state. At this time in 1896, you can remember that Kenyan, Kenyan people, about 46% of Kenyan population were living below poverty line. About 10 million of them live below poverty line. And therefore, in the policy paper recommendation of 1996, the government decided to make certain changes rather to move forward with social dimensions strategy. One of the mitigation was to involve women and the, in the undertaking of the economy, ensuring equality of women in achieving economic prosperity as a way of gaining or enhancing Kenyan economy. Also, government participating in ensuring basic social services like water, health, education, sanitation, roads, housing, and women are, and youth as well, are sponsored, regulated, and served by the state directly. And therefore, another particular element to consider was the National Poverty Fund that was implemented around in the, time, in the year 1985 to directly focus on poverty alleviation, targeted poverty alleviation, targeted poverty intervention schemes that collected about 10, 10 $24 million for the first three years in order to tackle poverty. So this particular is a, is a showcasing of why public enterprise was is a public good because uh, Savo National Park served the state for a long time, served the public if it were made private. For example, private enterprises might make certain exclusive zones within national parks. That was, that was one of the arguments of hoteliers and activists who were against the proponents of, you know, liberalizing national parks, making them private because private individuals might make even must might forego ethics in the management of national parks they might build skyscrapers of dubai dubai style skyscrapers within the national park eating sushi on top of the skyscraper making exclusive zones limiting people access to certain three parts of the national park which was against really public good this is a example actually a positive example of state Stack participating in the economy. Actually, Nya Estep was funded by the National Social Security Fund, NSSF. Actually, lived here when I was in Kenya, when I was studying at the University of Nairobi. I lived in one of the apartments here. It was a beautiful place. I couldn't imagine if the state did, did not participate in providing affordable housing to the citizens. I wonder if the citizens were able to access such affordable standard accommodative services. Yeah, this is the University of Nairobi, it's a public university, a national university. So actually I studied here. I wonder if I will I was able to study in this university if it were not for the state. I am from an uh, semi-arid region in Kenya and consider that Kenya you know at that time you know decided to participate participate directly in regulating education, ensuring education is affordable, particularly there was a clause for affirmative government affirmative action in ensuring that children who's, who are from under the, underprivileged uh, semi-arid regions who perform well are able to be uh, are sponsored to study in courses at public universities sponsored by the state. So I studied at this school I wonder if it was possible if I were expected to pay myself. Yeah, this map considers Kenya's timeline or its, or its practice or its you know, exploration of, of the structural adjustment programs. Kenya, by the way, you can see that Kenya had 
the highest length of time implementing SAP SAP and if we, you can see here that Kenya had actually one of the highest debt to GDP ratio at about 121.14 to 361.07 percent so you can see the red lines here pretty much most of these countries who took the structural adjustment model program have suffered a lot of debt shocks and therefore the debt to GDP ratio was at a very devastating unfavorable terms compared to the GDP. I'll try to make an end with an explanation of why the structural adjustment period was very devastating for Kenya. This is Madar Islam. It's located in Nairobi, capital city. It's one of the worst conditions where you know people have no social protections, no economic protections, and no health protections. Living within or within or below poverty line, this is one of the hallmarks, I would rather say, of the structural adjustment programs. In conclusion, I'll make an argument that even though I have painted a bad light on the structural adjustment period, I would like to say that the structural adjustment period had made good changes for Kenya. Particularly, remember the Kenyan economy was state controlled, state power, so it was a socialist. Kenya is a social, it was a socialist economy and it's still socialist and capitalist economy, mixed economy, a welfare state, partly market driven. However, there was a dictatorial rule, one party rule after independence. All the way to about 1990s, there was one party rule, one party dictatorship. There was no space for dissent. Political parties were crushed. There was no democracy, no electoral process no accountability, corruption, assassination. Actually, at one point, there was an active uh, underground chambers in Nairobi where political dissidents, who, people who tried to oppose the government, found themselves being tortured in these underground to torture chambers. And therefore, some parts of the structural adjustment programs required, you know, the countries to make some changes to include market liberalization, which also included acceptance of space or provision of space for freedoms and so on and so forth. The Kenyan constitution drive, there was a possibility of basic rights and democratic rights because remember, the donor aid was conditioned on certain changes and they therefore the government decided to accept a multi-party de multi -party democracy actually in 1992 so Kenya shifted from a one-party rule to accepting multi-parties. So, uh, for example, for, Forum for Restoration of Democracy was one of them. Kenya Social Congress, all of them had a space to fight for a chance to be elected, to be voted in. All of them had an alternative proposal for Kenya's economy. And therefore, there was also a space for civil service some civil society organizations, especially the Kenya Human Rights Commission, the Law Society of Kenya, independence of judiciary at this time, Kenyan, Kenyan constitution grew, became better, and Kenyan's political consciousness also developed, and therefore there was no spread of freedoms, there was spread of freedoms, spread of equality, fairness, democratic rights, political rights, constitutional, basic constitutional rights, even towards, actually, I would say in 2010, when Kenya decided to promulgate a new constitution that also enhanced further developed governance to make room for county governments to rule themselves, to manage their affairs, to reduce powers by the president, so that the president currently actually, as a, as a requirement of the 2010 constitution, the president has limited power and the governors of the county have more power to decide what choices they will take in their particular counties. This was really, I can say, a major shift from a country that just barely 50 years ago 
was run in a one party state was one party one party rule dictatorship the president had all the ultimatum all the rule is the he had the power in total and then of you know with the incoming of the structural adjustment model reforms economic reforms came with the freedoms electoral reforms democratic reforms and eventually the previous president now have limited power and power is distributed to various counties to various organs separation of powers between judiciary parliament executive and kenya have a driving kenyan middle class who enjoy more access more freedom i i, I want to say also the green belt movement i was a major role had a major role actually as a result of the structural adjustment programs not particularly as a result but perhaps as the sacrifices of the structural adjustment programs forfeited environment in in place of economy eventually later on there was adjustments to include environment sustainability environmental sustainability as part of the economy and therefore ecological conser- conservation became or came to the limelight we can remember wangari madai who became a nobel peace laureate in 2004 who was spearheading rights of, rights of keeping environmental rights actually keeping up with conservation of the environment and ensuring that Kenyan economy even though it was progressing it was not at the cost to the environment so beginning in 1992 since the first multi-party elections were accepted no longer up to now Kenya has made a shift a major shift and therefore i can basically say that the structural adjustment period even though was very devastating to the country Kenya made certain changes now Kenya compared to the neighboring countries like Tanzania and Uganda is in a much better shape and form in terms of economy in terms of gdp in terms of more market liberalization because it had an upper hand because it decided to participate more quickly or more or earlier than these countries so it had more practice with market liberalization it had more practice with it and it had more experience doing market liberalization more experience in the free market economy than these these countries like Tanzania and Uganda which are much more pretty much more closed than the Kenya's economy is currently and therefore the structural adjustment period even though devastating was very helpful i'll try to end my presentation here thank you so much for listening these are my references thank you